it. <laughs> Greetings, okay. Parish Orphans and Retrogrades. Today you get a bonus show. I had Michael Hitchborn on earlier and we had a great talk. It turns out that we're doing a bonus show on <laughs> the marital debt. Here we are. Why, and, and, and here is me and here is Steph. It turns out that uh, my favorite Catholic publishing company, which is Crisis Publications associated with Sophia Institute Press, published an interesting article on the marital debt. And specifically, the author is a young guy named Adam Lucas. And he made some really interesting points. And by interesting, I mean bad, just very bad. <laughs> some really, really wayward points about the marital debt. And the, the article is called The Trouble With Debates About Marital Debt. And we thought, hey, uh, this article by Mr. Lucas uh, points out some places where he has the audacity not to say that particularly Steph's book, Ask Your I Husband. I was mentioned, by the way. It was mentioned. I was mentioned in this Not article. that it, he said that not you were wrong. No. Yeah. But that whether or not you're wrong or right, which she's definitely right, it's very clear. He thinks it's, it might sound weird to assert the marital debt. So I, what I wanted to do today, as Steph gets this together. Sorry, I'm just posting links for the show. I'm, you're seeing me do right now what I'm doing over there usually. So. That's right. Pardon I'll me. just I'll just read the article while she gets that done, and then we have three big response points. But um, this is a really really clear issue, and folks, this is what's happening in modernist Catholicism. Folks that don't like the clear answer to this question: Is there a marital debt? They just talk around it. And he does that a lot. So, so let me just read this to you, and we'll, we'll start responding in real time. But I like to get out at least the first few paragraphs rather than jumping in after every paragraph. He says, the trouble with debates about marital debt. Every so often, the topic of marital debt comes up in the Catholic infosphere, causing much consternation and debate. Someone says something inflammatory. Someone calls them an idiot. And before long, marital debt is all over Catholic social media. Anyway on the Catholic internet knows it is back in vogue again with hundreds of posts a day. The subject has dominated my timeline as seen below. And he makes a ironical reference to a picture of his Instagram, which has not much action on it. Then he says, okay, fine. So maybe marital debt isn't such a hot issue right now. Once again, we love crisis. We love Sophia Institute. This is just a, a swing and a miss article. Um, <laughs> So he says, in fact, I'm late to the party, as the controversy mainly blazed almost a year ago with the release of the aptly attributed Mrs. Timothy Gordon's book, Ask Your Husband. I don't I'd like to say, welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, John, yeah, this uh, diehard, welcome to the party, pal. I mean, don't, hey, bro, don't get to parties late. You want to write on it? That's cool. You want to party when the party is partying. <laughs> right. You want to you want to hit it when it's popping, bro. Um, I don't know what this the aptly attributed Mrs. Timothy Gordon is. I, I love that you're associated with me. We just we've done two podcasts today. Mine yeah. with Hitchborn on this channel. Then both of us went on Elliot Hulse's channel, and he was just giving us so much love. I love Elliot Hulse, and he's like, bro. This is how to do marriage. Just follow what the church teaches. Uh, thank you, and Tim and Steph. So we, we love that love. We're not perfect or anything, but I am so proud that she is aptly attributed to me. This is my, this is my lovely woman, the <laughs> best woman in the world. And I don't know what that little parenthetical, the aptly attributed Mrs. Timothy Gordon means. Um, ask I take your it husband. positively. I'm taking of it course. positively. Of course. We choose to. We choose to take it positively as an act of the will. He continues, nevertheless, enough embers remain scattered throughout the Catholic world that fires pop up periodically. Hmm. And the topic has been on my mind personally as my wife and I prepare for our first child. Well, good. That means you were, let's get all these bad ideas out uh, right at the beginning, Adam. Let's get them all out. You got a long road to hoe. And we're going to help you out today. And that sounds cocky and a little bit smarmy. I don't mean it that way, but you got some bad ideas. Let's work through them. Well, we've been there with the, with the first kid and then the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and sixth and seventh. And I'm not trying to pull rank or anything. I'm just saying that we've had experience through these sorts of things. So when we're talking about the marital debt, we've been there and done that. So we're speaking from some experience here. Right. Thank you for saying that. I mean, this is the person being attacked, Mrs. Timothy Gordon. He says, and the topic has been on my mind personally is my wife and I prepare for our first child. And I didn't read this part. If my friends are to be believed, 
I prepare to forego marital relations for the next 18 years. Now, in kind of cucky world, or what I don't know what else to call it. not not cucky world that's mean in in slightly lower testosterone world this if my friends are to be believed business means oh my friends are all telling me to forgo marital relations for the next 18 years bro that ain't funny you know what you need to do you need to get new friends okay if your friends have testosterone here's here's the normal range and your friends are saying that they forgo marital relations. They're down here. They're in the negatives. Get new friends. I'm not joking now. You made a little joke, but in every jest is truth. And okay. you showed too much of your hand there. I'm, I'm not joking. I, I mean, for your good, Adam Lucas, and for your wife's good. You're probably never. a really good dude. Do not have friends like this. And never forgo or even like joke about that. That's Don't. serious. You know, I... The reason I think that um, we, we're never afraid to talk about anything controversial, especially things that make the feminists angry, and marital debt is the crown gem in that tiara. But, I mean, it's so important. We, we, get, we get communicated with all the time from people who are just, marriages are in a crisis. And I'd say on the top of the reasons of why is because sexual relationships within a husband and wife, or sexual relations between a husband and wife have gotten so unhealthy. So this is why we, you know, we're out here talking about it. And I think a lot of people who have a, a right sense of, of the, the crisis are out here talking about it. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're going to continue reading the article mm -hmm. and giving commentary as we go. But consider this, parish orphans and retrogrades. The Catholic bimillennial tradition, magisterium and tradition, calls sex relations between husband and wife, properly ordered, unit of procreative sex relations, the marital act, meaning the formal, the platonic formal act that marks this person as your number one. This mm -hmm. is my number one. This is my dearest love among flesh people. I should get one of those big foam fingers. Yeah. <laughs> How do you say that? And, and the thing that sets our relationship apart, you Manichaeans out there, you body mm -hmm. haters, you flesh haters, Gnostics, is that Steph and I have relations of this sort with one another, and it's really, really special. Can I just say? <laughs> same thing with all husbands and wives. The marital act, according to, go, go to uh, New Advent, Catholic Online Encyclopedia. It is the act that sets your relationship apart as special from all others. It anoints your relationship. You get cumulative extra grace every time you have it. It's really important. So if your friends, one more time, are telling you to forgo marital relations for the next 18 years, tell them. Two, take testosterone supplements, number one, because theirs is too low. And two, stop hanging out with them because birds of a feather flock together. I'm not joking now. I will say this before I continue reading, okay? This book, Ask Your Husband, brought the pain. It brought the pain. Brought the pain to the Catholic feminists out there, which are a lot of you, without even knowing it. And then... Those Catholic feminists did what they could to bring the pain back. It shook things up in a way that this book, which is a Sophia publication, a crisis publication, my book, The Case for Patriarchy, I mentioned all this stuff in here too, did not. Why? Because you had a woman saying it. Steph is like female Catholic Clarence Thomas. The right? internet's you know what he face gets called? melted off. Right. When I mentioned marital debt. <laughs> and a bunch of other stuff. Because you are the female Catholic Clarence Thomas for men's rights. Now, this is so what you're going to hear Mr. Lucas saying over and over again in the next section I'm about to read is, well, Steph, Mrs. Timothy J. Gordon may be right, but, right? So he's becoming a but philosopher. She may be right, but I don't want to talk about that. She may be right, but it sounds like a weirdo. No, no, my friend. Low T guys, you sound like the weirdos, okay? I, I'm, not, I'm just telling you. If you go hang out in a group of thick-necked, roughnecks who are maybe Catholic fallaway, secular guys, maybe they've never been to church a day in their life, they think you're the weirdo. Guys that joke about something that is near and dear to the heart of every man, sexual relations, not, not disordered ones, ordered ones. Men think about sex like a hundred times a day on average. They think you're the weird one to even crack a joke that you're foregoing marital relations for the next 18 years. I know you're gonna say it's a joke. 
Adam, when you see this. It's not funny. That is what causes feminism and divorce to run rampant, to destroy the family. It's like okay? the same joke as like the, like, let me go ask the boss type stuff. It's just, ugh, oh boy. Gross. Oh dear. <laughs> it's gro it is like, let me go ask my boss. No, you're her boss. Make her ask you. That's not, that doesn't make you a weirdo. Ask your husband. <laughs> ask your husband. What, so what you're going to hear him say a bunch of times is, I don't care what the truth is of the Christian teaching. What you're going to hear another iteration is, yes, the marital debt is a right. And a right is always a double right. It's the right of property itself, but the right to assert that right. Everything that's a right, a use, I-U-S, is a double right. Right to property, right to liberty, right to life, but also the right to assert it if someone's denying it to you. He's going to say, yeah, it might be a right, the marital debt, but if you have to assert it, you're an abusive ogre. That's not true. The right is the marital relations and the right to assert it. And more importantly, Christian teaching, timeless Christian teaching, inerrant Christian teaching is there because even healthy relationships see a trend where people are having to assert it. If a brother and a sister are riding with me in the car, my, my son and daughter, and they alternate riding in the front seat, Mr. Lucas is going to claim that their relationship has broken down, which it hasn't, just because they have to consult who rode in the front seat last time. That uh, You're asserting your right. No, you got last time. It's my turn. That doesn't mean the relationship is broken down. Are you crazy? This is anti-truth, anti-logos, anti-rights talk by feminists like Mr. Lucas. And he might be a perfectly nice guy, but let's get the bad ideas out now, okay? Let, let's continue. Marital debt, he says, generally speaking, refers to the obligation of spouses to provide exclusive sexual relations to the other. Listen to this. You'll love it, Steph. Generally speaking, this is uncontroversial. Mm -hmm. After all, a refusal to consummate the marriage, that means to do it once with your wife or husband, is grounds for annulment even in secular law, and adultery is grounds for divorce. Steph, is he saying then that the marital debt means you have to do it once only on your honeymoon? It sounds like he's saying that. I don't know. Yeah, I... Hmm. He, no, I, I mean, I'm being yeah. serious. He says, okay, look, this is uncontroversial. You have to do sex once with your spouse. We grant that. But then he goes on to say, the controversy comes whether this term is used in more particular theological ways. What does that mean? It's not a very good sentence, but here's what he means. He fleshes it out. He's going to assert more or less that the conjugal debt is abusive or wrong or misinterpreted if you mean doing it more than just, you owe it more than just on your honeymoon night one time. That's what this boils down to. The debt isn't just a requirement, so writes Mr. Lucas, to be a sexual partner in general some say that means once. So you, you're a member of the species. You have the specific difference. But an obligation to make love to your spouse each and every particular time they request it under pain of moral sin, unless you have a legitimate reason not to. Steph, you know more about this than me, actually. <laughs> but isn't that, didn't he take this directly from the Catholic definition from Scripture and St. Thomas? He's saying the debt isn't just a requirement to be a sexual partner in general, some say, but an obligation, some say, to make love to your spouse each and every particular time they're requested under pain of moral well, there's, sin. Unless, there's a reason what? that scripture in St. Thomas that are, is so, there's, it's so clear, is because of the way that God created human beings to have a very strong sexual desire. And so the marital debt... He goes on further and he talks about like people who talk about it sound like weirdos. It's like, yeah, you know what? In this culture, in this day and age, saying anything scriptural or pointing back to a time where men and women just functioned better together and more naturally many, many hundreds of years ago, you sound like a weirdo. Guilty as charged, I guess. Have you looked around? Have you seen the state <laughs> of marriages? It's a flaming dumpster fire. It's a flaming dumpster fire. So yeah, I guess I'm a big weirdo for talking about it or whatever. I'm a weirdo because I. this is literally what this guy is saying. I'm a weirdo because I'm not prepared to forego jokes. I'll grant that you're saying it's a joke. Even forego jokingly 
marital relations for the next 18 years. If I'm a weirdo, guilty as effing charged, bro. That's, that's a weirdo then. Here's the thing. I'll say this before we go on any further. The devil inverts truths. Here's what the devil did with the oldest. The, the original sin was feminism, right? With Adam and Eve in the garden. Proto-transgender. Proto-gender uh, dysphoria. Whatever you want to call it. So, the, the church, which has gone into this apostasy state, particularly with regard to marital relations, has made a mutual thing, conjugal debt, into a unilateral feminist thing. Whereas, actually, the teaching, this is a, a truly mutual thing. In, in reality, in St. Paul, we'll, we'll read the scripture, they, even Lucas cites it. It's mutual. Husband has to give it to wife, wife has to give it to husband. But Lucas and the feminists have spoken about it like it's unilateral. Like this only means that husbands can make wives have sex with them, not wives having husbands. This is because husbands are, have the greater appetite, right? We know what this is. But they made a truly mutual thing unilateral. Just as they made a unilateral thing, submission, only wives have to submit to husbands. Husbands don't submit to wives. They're the bosses. They've tried to make that mutual. The devil has made the unilateral mutual and the mutual unilateral. See how that comes? Now, he makes a, a, a sort of useless disclaimer about, you know, don't give in to a spouse who's asking us to sin, so don't have sex in front of a playground. I'm not even going to read that paragraph. But he says, people who endorse this view of marital debt, I don't know who that is. He just named one person. Me, I do. <laughs> largely lean on St. Thomas Aquinas, who appears, and, and, and he keeps saying appears to. He'll, he'll say something that's crystal clear, and then I'll say, well, it appears to do this. Am I supposed to say sorry for that? <laughs> Oops, for leaning on St. Thomas. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Who appears in Summa Theologica to take a similar stance. Um, no, he doesn't appear to take a similar stance. He actually, in fact, takes an identical stance. You can't say it's a similar stance. Steph quotes him. Aquinas is basing himself on St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 4 to 5, which states, I'm surprised he didn't say similarly, it states this outright, and he, he quotes it. The wife, it's mutual, does not have power over her own body, but the husband. Likewise, this is mutual, Likewise. unlike submission. Likewise, the husband does not have power over his own body, but the wife. Do not pro deprive each other except by mutual consent. That means you can say, hey, you know, let's, let's not do it for these, you know, for an hour or so, right? People should be fertile. They should be having lots of marital sex. That's how you have a healthy marriage, people. Subsequent popes, he continues, it is argued. No, it is not argued. It is cited. Subsequent popes, it is cited, Adam. Confirmed both Aquinas and St. Paul, because that's inerrant scripture, plus the common doctor. We have one common doctor, only one, Thomas. And so, quote, he says, parenthetically, they say, it is Catholic teaching required of all the faithful. Let me reread that sentence without all my annoying commentary. Subsequent popes, it is argued, confirmed both Aquinas and St. Paul. And so, they say, it is Catholic teaching required of all the faithful. See all the shade? He's throwing it clear inerrant catholic teaching i think it's because the conversation let's just be honest what's going on here in catholic circles is that it's so uncomfortable for any catholic talking head to say a the marital debt exists yes ladies that applies to you <laughs> and c the reason we're talking about it is because so many women are denying their husband sex these days for reasons they they think is legitimate that's just the, the plain facts thank you thank you <laughs> thank you thank you is that one of the top five reasons you wrote this book yes i mean for heaven's sakes people we, we are... i have gotten more communication from men it's a crisis it is an absolute crisis that men are like listen i married my wife i love her i i just i want to i want to express myself with her sexually and it's destroying our marriage because we are not we're not healthy in that way sexual relationships or your sexual relation in marriage is so fundamental it is the just it's so fundamental it's the it's, marital act. it's the marital act and and because feminists have just been shrieking so loudly in the culture to empower women to deny their husbands we have catholic wives and mothers out there they're saying oh well 
I, I can reject my husband for this, 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 and this reason. And I'm like, no, uh, this is the thing I'd like to, like, I'll just take a sidebar and say, this is something I'd like to, like, address, my, like, my Catholic sisters out there who try to say that. Oh, well, I have a good reason. I have a good reason. Think about this from the perspective of your husband. It is, there is nothing more personal of a, there's no more personal of a rejection than a husband coming to his beloved wife and wanting to express himself sexually with her, as is his right, and her putting up the blog and being like, nope, not tonight. So Think about it from the perspective of your husband. Yeah. How, you realize how <laughs> insulting and degrading and belittling that is to be rejected in that way? And we, I literally hear about this all the time where women are like, well, I'm tired, I'm this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, you know what? Quit your job. Deal with it, ladies. Quit your job. That's Which your you husband. Got? He's trying to. That's your king. I mean, good heavens. When we're in a society right now where, where women are literally saying, but I was tired. It's like, you think that you can hurt your husband's feelings and, and deny him and reject him just because you were tired? If the shoe were on the other foot oh and a gosh. woman, oh, can you imagine? If the shoe was on the other foot and a woman wanted to express herself sexually to her husband, and her husband's like, I'm tired, babe. She would feel so horrible it would be just the, the height of disrespect and dismissal it is completely inappropriate in marriage now there are times like i stated in my book before all the feminists face start melting off where there's legitimate reason a man and woman cannot have sexual relationships but those things are legitimately rare and they're grave and they're grave and right. people are talking about St. Joseph and all that. We can talk about that later. We're talking about in just regular, not St. Joseph and the Holy Family. Are like, you a consecrated virgin, sweetheart? Not so. <laughs> Lots of... Yeah, Did you not, give birth to the Lord? Okay, we're not right. talking to you. <laughs> right. Well, a lot of these are women, and this is what men in the red pill space, the secular red pill space say. Yeah. These women are anything but consecrated virgins in college. Sorry, ladies. A lot of them are the opposite of consecrated virgins in college. They run around with every Tom, Dick, and Harry in college having marital relations. Marry some nice, maybe low testosterone, sort of humble guy, and they're denying him all the time. Un unlike what they did with Tom, Dick, and Harry. Men, this should enrage you. This should enrage you. That's why it's a mortal sin. Okay, Even if they didn't do this. Even if they were a virgin, most virgins don't act like this in the bedroom. Most female virgins are pleased to quote unquote put out in the bedroom. Most of the women that are causing this trouble were the ones that are anything but virgins. Okay, so that's a fact. That's a fact. I'm not saying that no virgin has ever been tempted to mortally sin by denying her husband or her husband to deny his wife. Like I said, this is actually a, mut a real mutual rapport that's dis disclaimed by St. Thomas. Whereas, um, Whereas submission is unilateral, and the liars have tried to make that uh, mutual. They, well, the they liars are trying to make any husband who's out there saying, I need to have sex with my wife regularly as some sort of creep monster. Instead of just acknowledging just plain facts, men are built differently that way, and they require that. They require it on, typical, uh, on average more than women do. It's a man's nature. It just as everyone's always talking about this is a woman's nature. A woman needs to be fulfilled in this way. A woman needs to be filled in this way. Same thing goes with dudes, guys and, and gals. Yeah. It's just, it's always just a one-way road. I tell you, we just did this interview, people, with Elliot Holes, my, my good buddy from Seamask Shows on Friday. And he's like, you guys are so fun to interview together. <laughs> and I, I, he was saying, Tim, for your closing part, he has Steph her own closing part. What should men do to meet that are young and single and want to meet good women? I said, you know what? You, you can meet a good woman anywhere. I guess even in a Catholic church. But if you want to play the numbers, what you ought to do, young men, because Catholics are messed up. Look at this filth. You ought to go to the South, meet a good Protestant girl, because they're much less feminist infiltrated. Convert her to Catholicism before you get married. Convert her to Catholicism, and that, and, and you will have a good wife. It'll be less of a leap. Show them the Protestant theology is obviously wacky, but most Protestants, particularly in the South, know from the pop culture, the pop Protestant 
post-Protestant pop culture. Men should be leaders. Men have different appetites. Women should give in. And men should give in to their wives, too, if they, if they have a high sexual appetite. If they're very sexually mature women, God bless them, right? That's good for them, and that's good for their husbands. But most often, women are sexually immature. I'm, I'm sorry to drop facts on well, you. Well, because of the and, sexualization, unfortunately, of the modern female is that she's not everybody, but they're usually out there having amorous relations before they meet their husband. And then they're kind of spent by the time that they meet the good guy. And then it's just kind of takes a nosedive. This dive. is not a big problem with it's virgins. It's unfortunate. And it's a huge, I mean, people who write articles like this can call us weirdos all you want. To which, about he does talking, which he does Which he does for talking about this but listen i care greatly about uh catholic marriage and particularly this what we have tim and i have built this whole postulate is basically built upon uplifting catholic marriage and to do so you have to have a spine and you have to be able to say these are the problems and sex relations within husband and wife in this day and age is awful it's awful it's just the foundation, everyone's foundation from, uh, 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 yeah, sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm babbling. You just made the I'm joke. I'm just angry. Yeah, you ain't babbling. <laughs> he just made the joke. Hey, be prepared if, if my friends are correct to go 18 years without doing the marital act. Uh, so, but, yes. but I, I meant what I said. And I meant it when I said it to Elliot's young men who, you know, he's got 800,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel. Ca young Catholic dudes, go find a Protestant girl and convert her. When I went and I gave a talk on this book, at Franciscan a year and a couple months ago, a lot of angry young feminists that you think are going to a faithful Catholic school, they don't accept the Catholic teaching. Go get a Protestant and convert her, young men. Leave the young feminist Catholic women to repent. That's what I say. Listen to what he says. This is what they were saying to me, all the feminists. Most of them were girls. Some of them were low-T guys. Listen to what uh, Adam Lucas says next. It's what they were, that folded arms body language meant to me when I gave my talk on the, the case scowls. for patriarchy. So many scowls. He just reads Holy Scripture, which is inerrant. He reads the common doctor. We have a lot of unimportant doctors in the church. Four of them are, are women who are just added after Vatican II, just so women can feel egalitarian or whatever. One is called the common doctor. One is called the angelic doctor, St. Thomas. He just read that and he read inerrant Scripture. And he says, next paragraph, now, I have my own doubts about whether this is really Catholic teaching. What? It's in Scripture, dude. And St. Thomas backs it up. So. And Saint, yeah. Oh, Thomas is getting <laughs> okay. overrated. Very common dangerous trap. We have a common doctor. All these other guys, sorry, if you like Bonaventure, you like Scotus, all that. Have fun, man. We don't even have the Thomistic corpus fully translated into English, and he's the common doctor. Get real. Thomas runs laps around everyone. That's why everyone quotes him. Now, he says, but my own doubts don't matter, but they don't matter, my own doubts. For the purposes of this article, let's even grant. Oh, he, he's acting like he's being charitable, giving a grant. No, it's just that the Bible said it. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent. Holy inerrant scripture just said, you're not humble, you're the opposite of humble. For the purposes of this article, let's even grant that the narrative is correct. Well, it is correct! Which is why everybody is super upset about it. Which is why <laughs> these Catholic feminist chicks aren't Catholic. And that's why everybody's like just like like dancing around the issue. Nobody wants to address just the truth because they don't want to make everybody mad. That's he what says, it is. <laughs> let's even grant that in some official and technical way, official and technical, like we're being legalistic, Catholics are bound to sleep with their spouses whenever insisted upon under pain of sin. Not in a technical way, just in a practical way. <laughs> if you don't want to have sex with your spouse, man or woman, woman or man, who's like, hey, can I have sex with you right now? Like, I need to work off some energy or whatever. <laughs> and you say no, you're in mortal sin, whether you're a man or a woman. Unless okay? you happen to be like in a coma. <laughs> we're not, but, but we don't say this with, with everything. Exception makes bad law. You're I not know. in a coma. Yeah. You can't speak if you're in a coma. <laughs> if your private parts are falling off, okay, you're part of the exception. That's a grave exception, but it's not. It's not a technical official way. Catholics are, in fact, bound to sleep with their spouses whenever insisted upon, under pain of mortal sin. The trouble, he says, with subsequent discussions of such a debt is they overlook the larger context of human relationships that render the truth or falsity irrelevant. Oh, whoa. See, I would charge whoa, whoa. him of that. Yep. 
once you start saying, he, he just said, the principle of non-contradiction doesn't matter. That's what the subtext is, clearly. Truth and, and falsity doesn't matter. This, do you even want, should I even finish reading this <laughs> Joker's Please article? Do. What a goofball. <laughs> Truth and falsity doesn't matter. The trouble with subsequent discussions of such a debt is they overlook the larger context of human relationships that render the truth or falsity irrelevant. No. The larger co context is what proves or, or, or gives the lie to the truth or falsity of propositions. Propositions are everything. You can never contradict truth and be doing the right thing. And there you have it. Relativism. This guy's a relativist. He says you could contradict truth and be doing really the right, really the context specific right thing. He's, these people are infected. These theology masters people that don't have a, a grounding in philosophy, which you need before you go on to study theology. They start saying things like this. He doesn't even realize it's a contradiction. This is a contradiction of the principle of non-contradiction. It's a contradiction of the principle of the excluded middle. It's a contradiction of the principle of causation. Okay. You can't just say stuff like this. Truth or falsity be damned. You could do the false thing and it's really better. That's what he's saying. Everything within marriage, he writes, takes place in the context of a loving self-gift. Don't know what that means. That sounds, sounds like something, I don't know, John Paul II meant. It doesn't have a lot of meaning. Okay? It's about duty and benefit. Right and onus. Okay? I don't know what a loving self-gift even is. Plus, don't I would say just apply that sentence to the wife in the conversation that he quotes later, which I want to read. Okay. You'll see he, it. That's what you should be telling the woman in that conversation. No, no, you read this passage. Okay, because that this is exactly what... And it's not always the women, I guess. Sure. If guys are low T enough, maybe they're the ones that are pushing their wives away. Maybe they're like... Yeah, just read the rest of that paragraph. He goes on to say exactly what you were addressing. Starting in there. adult relationship, love, relationships, love drives us to give as much room as possible to the desires and preferences of the other. If both spouses are really aiming for a, self of, a gift of self, the requesting party would back down after hearing their partner's reluctance. What? Uh, everything within marriage takes place in the context of a loving self-gift. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, that just continues. Uh, just this is so disordered I no just, no that's I don't... good that's good everything within marriage the next sentence is takes place in the context of a loving self-gift in adult relationships love drives us to give as much room as possible to the desires and preferences of but the other that's not correct it's literally the marital debt is always you err on the side of having the marital act that's the whole point he's trying to say you... the opposite it's bizarre world if both spouses are really aiming for a gift of self which is sex Gift of self is not the, the one spouse saying, I don't want to have sex tonight. And you say, okay, that is, if it's the woman and she's saying, I don't want to give myself. Then you have a big problem. Then you have a big problem. Gotta, big, this is what we've been talking about for, for years now. It's, this guy's confused. It's that, listen, the, the very sentence after hearing your partner's reluctance just back down. Okay, you have a big major problem and, 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 and it can be worked around, but you need to find out why your spouse is reluctant to have intercourse. He gave a, 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 an example earlier about not wanting to do it in a playground. Let's get real with our examples here. If you're, in a, if you're hanging out with your spouse and it's, and it's the right time and place or whatever, it's not in a public area or some ridiculous example or like on top of a roller coaster or whatever. Well, it sounds fun. If you're Let's in your house and you're in, things are like normal, you're in a normal setting, let's say that, and your partner is is consistently reluctant the the proper response is not backing down because reluctance has presented itself right it's finding out what the reluctance what what's what what is the cause of that and asserting the right and asserting the right yes. find out the cause i agree with you i agree with you we didn't pre-talk about this no we talked find about out, this none we just saw this what's your like, damage oh, boy. what's your damage lady what's your damage dude like we are supposed to be having sex with each other a lot that it's the marital act and the loving self-gift, I don't even know what the hell that means. Sounds like John Paul II language. It's flowery, it's floored, but it doesn't make much sense. I think the loving self-gift means it's like the principle of existence. It's, existence is always better than non-existence. Sex is always better than non-sex. So he, he, he inverts a premise that ought to favor what Steph argued in this book, Ask Your Husband, 
and he's trying to twist it and make the loving self gift of sex mean that the wife is trying to lovingly give you a self gift by not having sex with you and you honor that. Listen to what he says. In adult relationships, love drives us to give as much room as possible to the desires and preferences of the other. More relativism. No, 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 no. In adult relationships, the best thing is not just the preference of one over the other, but the preference for the marital act. For the you greater see? good for of the, the relationship. Good. That's the loving thing is for the greater good of the relationship, having the sex. People can have disordered preferences that damage the relationship. And that's all this paragraph, to be fair to, to Mr. Lucas, I would just say to you, like that's all your paragraph is saying. You're saying one of these pe persons has a disordered preference and the disordered preference needs to be heated. No, 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 no. That is not, la if you're in, on your first child i can tell you that 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 is not a good model moving forward for a long healthy happy marriage you guys have to figure out not that it's he's speaking that this is him speaking but i would say anybody who's saying this you need to figure out what is blocking or what is causing your spouse's reluctancy to have marital relations what damage what personal damage they have that makes them uh, act as a kind of a stopper a stopper uh, unjust estoppel on this healthy and highest act. Do a crossword puzzle together, watch a movie, go to a theme park, uh, take a nap together. But those aren't as holy or as good as marital sex, as long as it's unitive and procreative. You get it? And I think, and too, the culture, unfortunately, has made a big joke and just made everybody used to seeing on TV commercials and movies and stuff, the, the, the husband being rejected. Everyone's comfortable seeing that image of a husband extending himself to a wife and the wife being like, not tonight, honey. And everyone in the audience laughs. Ah, ha, 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 ha. It's not funny. That man is being rejected by his wife. That is an enormous deal. That hurts a man's self-esteem, his pride. It's just, it's terrible. It's not, it's not joke worthy. It's the same thing we say about like happy wife, happy life. It's gross. It's, it's, it's a you. gross joke. And it's, it points to a sickness in our culture that men who, who are rejected by their wives, it's something that we all laugh at and think it's cute of the wife that she does that or oh. <laughs> How funny. Oh, isn't that always the way? I don't. And you don't. <laughs> Step, Miss Steph Gordon, like I said, she's the Catholic female uh, uh, Clarence Thomas of men men's rights. She cannot stand a commercial. Mm -hmm. You do not know the degree to which abide. this woman is not. She will not <laughs> sit there for a commercial when it's a man being uh, abused by his spouse. She cannot watch Catholic content with men who are being abused by their spouses. She wrote it's this icky. book. She wrote this book, Ask Your Husband, because it's so vile and satanic and evil. The handmaidens mistreating their husbands who are supposed to be their prophets, priests, kings so badly. And you know what? What was the response to this book? What was it? Everybody's face is melted off. Everyone's face Which melted is off. fine. Which I, just, it, I was expecting that. <laughs> you, you, we were expecting it. You weren't expecting it to melt off as much as it did. I told you yeah. it would be bad. You were surprised at the amount. I even am surprised very, very graciously when my Patreon got pulled down for a, an issue that I'm, I'm confident Matt Fratt agrees with me about. Uh, LMNOP, Skittles. Um, Matt attempted to come to my aid and he, he put up a, a very very kindly video i mean this the thought behind it was nice a video the three minute video saying hey this is bad support tim but even in the video he's wringing his hands and it's because of these two books because even no matter how much scripture and teaching we cite it make it makes matt uncomfortable that's what he was he didn't cite it specifically but he meant i have big disagreements on the feminism issue. Because women right? have lost their minds. Because women have lost their minds. In society. So, so he didn't want to come. He, he wanted to do a noble thing. And and he said, look, Tim wouldn't take a video down. And that's very noble. Can Don't I ever you? take a video down just because people tell you to. And then, you know what? That video disappeared. He, I, I think he took that video down because the feminist lobby, I would guess, is so strong. That video disappeared 36 or so hours after it was up. That's really really sad people can't hear the truth on this issue it's really sad
I'd like to use, I'd like to read the dialogue, but the the fake dialogue between the husband and wife. But before, can you address this um, sentence? He says, "Any situation where one party starts insisting upon their rights means the relationship has already broken down." Whoa! No! Whoa! No! 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 no. <laughs> you do not. Rights are there. Every right is a double right. Right to property is the right to possess the land is is the land itself, but it's also the right to assert the right to the land. You understand? This is something we deal with in property law all the time. Every right's a double right. You don't just get the land. You get the right to assert the land if someone should challenge it. So it's a double right. Every right is a bundle of sticks, every property professor says. So a right, and this comes from the Catholic tradition like all the other American and English common law. He's saying what he's trying to say. Again, these guys, they study two years of theology or whatever, but they don't have the classic training and arguments or thought to back it up. He says, any situation where one party starts insisting upon their rights means that the relationship is broken down. So he's saying it's disordered to stand on your use. What he's saying is rights are real and true, but asserting them is illegal or abusive. No, in a perfectly good, perfectly healthy relationship, perfectly good siblings, brother and sister, my, you know, my son and daughter, we ride to the store and there's always a fight over the front seat. And guess what? Guess what? They always have to say, wait, whose right is up? They have to defer to taking turns. Guess what that is? That means that the well-ordered relationship is informed by rights discussions. And that's by the imposition of rights. Wait, is it your turn? You know, be, I want the front seat. No, you got it last time, Maggie. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, you take it. Rights guide us. That's why the conjugal debt is there, people. You get it? And He's saying it's disordered to do the ordered thing. Consider the classic sitcom scene of a husband testing the waters with his wife. You read that. It's really gross. Yeah. What were you going to say? Sorry. Um, Sorry. Yeah, and I would just say as far as like asserting your rights. Wow. That is the entire point of an argument between right. a husband and wife is that one person is falling short. The other person is kind of asserting their right over their the other to say, hey, you're owed, you owe me something you're not giving me and working through that. Asserting your right is a fundamental right practical. and it's practice practical. in marriage. He's you saying, have well, it's theological, that. but it's not practical. Because no, no, we're no. fallen. You have to call each other to account. And the only way to do that is asserting your rights. In right. the bedroom, about finances, about how to treat one another, about being respectful. being too grouchy? I see lots of yeah, husbands that are too grouchy with their spouse. Am I ever too grouchy with you? No. Um, it's not my flaw. No. People always like to have like I, like fanciful ideas of what they think our marriage is like, and Tim's never grouchy with me. He I'm not a grouchy like, guy. No. But so, but I, I see some otherwise good men being too grouchy with their wives. Um, I see a lot of wives being grouchy with their husbands. Oh, boy. If you say, hey... It's my right to be treated a certain way. That doesn't mean the relationship is fundamentally broken the way he says. That's not right. Um, so the point is, what this guy is doing is what everyone attempted to do to this lovely woman here <laughs> with regard to her book. What did they do? They all said the same thing, Steph, didn't they? You might be right. But you're mean. But it's mean or impractical. I don't care. It's, no, 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 no. It's not I don't yeah. care. That's yeah. not the right response. It's I'm right and nothing but insisting on what's right and true is practical. Yeah. This is the only practical thing. Having lots of marital sex, husband to wife, wife to husband, is the only thing that keeps marriages together in, in the ordinary sense. I'm not talking about someone it's, who has their legs ripped off or whatever. It's incredible that we have to say this. To adults. I just... Ah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the article goes on and he says, consider the classic sitcom scene of a husband testing the waters with his wife. Again, only a beta thinks this is even Yeah, funny. this whole watch, conversation watch. just hurts my heart so much. I, says, a poor guy. Me, maybe we could, dot, dot, dot. And the wife, here's her line. I'm sorry, honey, but I'm exhausted and have to wake up early. Let's try tomorrow again. Boop, stop right there. Tomorrow. Cut, cut, cut right there. The conversation goes on. Cut right there. That's the problem. That's the problem right there. I'm sorry, honey, but I'm exhausted and have to wake up early. Let's try tomorrow instead. Or she could just say, I'm rejecting you because I would rather get sleep. I don't care about your feelings or your and bodily health or any of that. To use his fruity language, I don't feel like the, give of self, the gift of self-love right now, or whatever that stupid term is that he keeps using, I don't want to give 
self-love. I want to be unloving. What's the other term for an act that is fundamentally unloving? Disordered? Sin. I want to sin right now. Because okay? I'm tired. Because I'm tired. Not because a good reason. I'm thinking of me rather than thinking of the other. He tried to make that the holy thing that ought to be honored. The, what ought to be honored is the, the man... We talk about ways that men are naturally, uh, women are naturally virtuous all the time, right? They don't struggle with rage, uh, things like that. Well, men are naturally very affectionate, aren't we? <laughs> women uh, and pe- men and women out there too. Don't feel bad about this. Men are more naturally affectionate than most women. It's a great lie to say the other way around, the love languages thing. But just women, men are naturally very affectionate. Particularly high testosterone men are naturally affectionate. I was even talking about this with. One of my friends were always, you know, you know, because you play football, you play basketball, you like the contact. I like, even if Steph's sitting here, I like if she puts her leg on me. I want to feel some weight, flesh against flesh. I like it. I played sports, you know, I got a lot of testosterone. That's just how it be. When Men like it. Did the, can we just, when did the tired thing become co- part of the, the common parlance for a valid excuse yeah. to deny your husband sex? Right. I, I'm, I'm baffled. I'm baffled at this phenomenon. People literally, for their example, it wasn't like, I'm sorry, honey. I was just hit by a truck and I'm currently in a coma. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a raging migraine. That that Should that be the one that's kind of in between grave and maybe not so grave? I'm tired. Okay. How about I didn't get up and go to work this morning because the alarm went off and I was... A little tired. Bit tired. A little bit tired. <laughs> what are you talking about? Who are these low T cucks this shit is that, working that, on? That is. I'm tired. I'm tired right Yikes. now. I have to finish the podcast. <laughs> I'm a mother of seven. I'm tired all the time. You're tired all the if time. I, if I use that as an excuse, it would just never happen. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, he, this this shit it's, goes on though. It's, it's absurd. It's so absurd. I hear it everywhere. Like, what if the woman is tired? And I'm always like. Yeah, and and I'm waiting for like the actual excuse to right. come in. Like, and was she hit by a bus? On right. Top of it? <laughs> She's tired because her legs were sawed off by a were bitten off by a Laplander. <laughs> well, okay, that's a good excuse. Just being tired. I'm never not tired. Do you, we go to bed late. We wake up relatively. We don't wake up early, but we don't get a nine hours sleep. I don't get seven hours a night. I go to bed late. I wake up, start the homeschool, get going. What's going on is all these broads are out there working. Which they shouldn't yeah, be. Yeah, because in that line it says, and I have to get up, wake up early. Presuming Why? that whatever the chores are for the next day are, are more important. Like she has to prepare herself yeah. for chores or a schedule. Uh, that's not more, the, your schedule and your work is not more important than your marriage. Right. So, so that's another problem with that sentence right there. Well, already you don't care and, about Oh, and then the other one, let's try tomorrow instead. Hmm? Shall we? Shall we try tomorrow? Try tomorrow. I'm not going to commit to anything because I don't right. know if I'll be tired tomorrow too, but let's try. Let's see how I feel. <laughs> it goes on. Okay, so, he, so, then, so the husband in this scenario responds, nope, too bad. St. Paul says our bodies are not our own but belong to our spouse and I have power over your body as your husband and so you must respect my sexual rights under pain of hell. Based. See, that's that was the one thing that was, that's true. Okay, yeah. the wife in this, hmm. Well, I can't even read this because it's like, this is so, the wife in this is so like the anti stuff that I'm going to be like struggling through my own rage and, <laughs> and discomfort to even read the Senate. So bear with me as I choke on my own words here. <laughs> wife. Hmm. Well, with my power over your body, you better sleep on the couch tonight under pain of losing a valuable digit if you catch my drift. What the f- See, flip, a man. woman like that th- should have been dumped on the first date. I mean, she sound, she's <laughs> threatening to cut your penis off? I, this, this is, is funny. This is the type of what conversation regarding the marital debt. And these are the people that say that we're weirdos for just saying, have as much marital sex as you possibly can because it helps and keeps your marriage healthy. We're the ones that be called, uh, called the weirdos. When people have this sort of unhealthy dialogue about something that's, that was given to us and is holy and sanctioned by God. And healthy. This is so disordered compared to just what like people who advocate for the marital debt say. It's just like, yeah, you marry somebody you love and like, have sex with them as much as possible. I mean, oh, and, and sorry, sorry, this just doesn't check out. I, I know the type. I don't, I don't know who wrote this article. I've never seen a picture. But I bet a large sum of money. I bet four figures of money, four figures, uh, that this is a, a guy with what's commonly... He represents an interest, even if it's not him. A pencil neck dude that 
guys, big, tough, strong men guys like Elliot Hole, so my buddy, quite frank, frankly, you know, I think I had some some hand or another in both of their rever recent reversions. Uh, yeah, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I had something to do with both of those guys. Cool dudes, secular dudes. Frank's a rocker and has a, a really great show, one of the main shows I listen to. Uh, Elliot Holtz is a famous strongman bodybuilder. Uh, Elliot's big in the Red Pill community. You know, cool, secular dudes. They look at me and Steph and they go, dude, you guys... I love you. I love you guys. I showed this to my buddy and his wife. I showed this to my wife. I showed this to all of these bros in my gym. I showed your video and they're like, oh, okay. Catholics are cool. Catholics aren't weird losers who can't bench press the bar. You're the weirdo. That's, I'm, not, I'm trying to say it as nicely as I can. You, look, you sound like you can't bench press the bar. If you think it's even a funny joke or lovable or laughable, that a wife might say under pain of losing a valuable digit if you catch my drift. That's the whole thing. I'm it's going wrong with society to, right now. It's it wrong right with it's you just, guys. You're, everyone's laughing at you, not me and Steph. If we don't care <laughs> what folks think about us. Like I say, just lost the Patreon account. I've lost jobs. We're going to make people I've, super mad with this video right now. Right. <laughs> right. That, you know, we've, we've um, you know, the first edition of this caused all sorts of hell and scandal. Uh, this is the second edition, now self-published. Like, we don't care, okay, what people think. But for Adam, whatever, what's his last name? Lucas? Lucas. You seem to care, and here's, here's the, the, the news. Here's the rub. Secular dudes that aren't, like, male feminists, they think we're cool. They think we make Catholicism interesting. They think we make Catholicism look like it corresponds with men's masculine nature because it is. It's a patriarchy, a clerical patriarchy, only males, and a household patriarchy. Men run truly Catholic households. And men are drawn to being told, yes, you should have sex a lot, particularly high testosterone men. So he later says weirdo. This, this okay, you no, go. So you the go. next sentence after this is his, his voice again. He says, invoking the language of marital debt seems completely out of place in healthy relationships and a sure signal of a bad one. Whoa. That is... I'm without speech. I am without He's speech. He's taking <laughs> the Catholic teaching and saying, I don't care whether this is true or false. To someone that wants to follow the Catholic teaching and let it guide their lives practically is disordered. And I'm well-ordered because my wife... Or whatever he might not be saying his wife, but he's saying it's it seems well ordered, and a normal thing for a wife to threaten to cut her husband's Johnson. This 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 sentence I just read was the baloney in the sandwich of the sentence before, that a wife threatening to cut her husband's digit off if she catches her, if he catches her drift, and the next sentence was the talking about the marital debt is a, uh, is a signal of a bad relationship. I just like <laughs> you can't write it. What? Like what? Seriously? It's a sign is... of a bad relationship that a husband is like, hey, let's have sex. And the wife's like, dude, cool. Come on, or vice versa. <laughs> come on, Lucas. Come on, dude. Come on, bro. Come on. Whatever you Come on. Is. We'll have you on. We'll have like a talk about this live on air. You... And maybe you could just say, just strike the whole thing off the record. A cri crisis should take this down. Take it down. Like they say on Twitter. Boop. I mean... I have Bring power over your food. body. This is the well-ordered woman. I have power over your body, and so you must respect my sexual rights under pain. Oh, no, that's the man saying that. And the wife says, well, I have power over your body, so you better sleep on the couch tonight. No. Men, if women say this, say, uh, come and take it. That's my come couch. Come and make me. <laughs> that's my couch. This is my bed. I'll, I'm the man. I pay the bills. You can sleep there. Under pain of losing a valuable digit, he's referring to the, the penile organ. If you catch oh, my drift. No. That's a well-ordered woman, according to this guy, I guess. Or her, her well-ordered response to an abusive man who says, this is who just, crazy. Who just exercises his right as a male. Okay, so moving on. He says, this is the trouble with talking about the marital debt. The discussion poses uh, as being about what Thomas says or what scripture means, guilty as charged, yeah. or the magisterium preaches about a very specific aspect of moral theology. But in reality, it's about whether we are human or not. 
Those who insist upon the marital debt as some sort of Catholic teaching or even a teaching at all come off as total weirdos. <laughs> so the guy who said it's normal or to be expected that the wife will threaten to cut off the Johnson of the husband <laughs> for asserting the Christian. It's not just Christian law. It's natural law, too. Men want to have sex with women. Women uh, want to have sex with men. Again, it, this is not a big problem with virgins. This is typically a problem with women who during college ran around and slept with every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Then they marry some low-T guy who's been waiting for his chance. He's so polite. He's so PG. He's such a nice guy, and he's, he's asking permission for everything. I mean, you know, I'm not saying to become a rapist. But he's asking for everything. But that's everything. what the feminists always say. They're like, oh, are you saying that a husband can rape his wife? How yeah. dare you, sir? For just saying that a, cu that, that a marital no. debt is a real thing. He cannot because that's the whole point. He should not have to. Well-ordered <laughs> marriage. You really said that. <laughs> no, no. I mean, he's not allowed to. But St. Paul is taking that, even out, that, that term even out of definition. Yeah. Right? Because it's a mortal sin. For, uh, I guess the wife can mortal sin. You can't prior restrain her from mortal sinning. Okay, can we read that, that part be... of Thomas real quick? Because we keep throwing on mortal sin and some people are like, oh, what about a mortal sin, mortal sin, mortal sin? And everyone's like freaking out. And this is what happened with my book. Um, so it's St. Thomas Aquinas states, if the husband is be rendered incapable Sorry. of paying the debt through a cause consequent upon marriage, for instance, through having already paid the debt and being unable to pay it, the wife has no right to ask him again. And in doing like that's so, ever happened. <laughs> and in doing so, she behaves as a harlot rather than like a wife. But if he be rendered incapable through some other cause, then um, then if this be a lawful cause, he is he is not bound, and she cannot ask. But if it be an unlawful cause, then he sins, and his wife sins. Should she fall into fornication on this account, is somewhat imputable to him. So. Thomas even goes further and says that if a if a if a hus if a wife denies her husband and the husband falls into sin because of that, I guess through lust or some sort of other sin, then right. that sin actually goes back on the wife for denying. Right. So hence he should be endeavored to do his best that his wife may remain continent. So that's Thomas, but scripture, there's many scriptures talking about the marital debt. So just so people have reference to what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, so, the, I mean, that's really important. We don't have to get into the full meat of that Thomas quote, but I will say it once. The logic, Steph, I, I was kind of, my, I was thinking of something else, but the logic is Thomas says, if either spouse requests sex, is denied by their spouse, and then has lustful thoughts that the fault is largely the denier, mm -hmm. that's remarkable, isn't it? Lust is really hard to control. Now, we're accountable to our maker to controlling it. But you actually formally cooperate with the lust of your spouse if you deny them. Do you understand how important that is? Thomas says it, and guess who says it also? St. Paul in Inerrant Scripture, in the very passage he read from. Let's go on to, he says, so, so again, he said, um, people come off as total re weirdos who talk about the real debt for reasons that have nothing to do with their arguments from historical theology. Who knows and who cares if they're being bad Thomas? I do. That matters. That matters. Um, what causes alarm is instead an apparent lack of sensitivity to healthy rationality. Relationality. Relationality. What? No, the lack of sensitivity to healthy relationality is, according to the teaching, what? Ever denying your spouse who wants sex. And again, this is not just women. This is men to women too. For, for the cucks out there, the low T guys that need to hear it. Apparently, there are a lot of you. Um, for an apparent lack of sensitivity to healthy relationality, the term for that, according to the Roman Catholic faith, if you accept it, is denying your spouse sex. It doesn't work the other way. Sex is better than non-sex in a marriage. It doesn't work both ways. You don't get to claim the aegis of being mindful of sensitivity to healthy relationality and at the same time deny them for unlawful reasons. He's trying to make the argument work in favor of, uh, uh, it sounds, look, Aristotle says that men wage revolutions for reasons of their private life. I don't know this guy. I haven't met him. I don't know what he looks like. 
I'm not trying to judge him. I'm sure he's a really nice person in a lot of ways. It sounds like he's trying to wage to stage a revolution on Catholic teaching for what may be, I'm not sure, reasons of his private life. That's what Aristotle says, so I would guess. Sounds like a lot of autobiography, and that's what Steph heard a lot of when she wrote this. A lot of autobiographical false reasons, invalid reasons, to reject the true Catholic teaching, which is men are in charge. Submission is unilateral. Women must submit to their husbands and always accept sin. And ironically, the conjugal debt is mutual. Men and women must always give up, give it up to their partner, their married partner, when they want it. That's not unilateral. Well, I think it's Very all strange. just bread and circuses, the whole question about marital debt. I think that the reason that we get yeah. articles like this and talking heads out there trying to skirt around the issue is because they don't want to make women mad. And that's what's happening. The minute that women get mad on the internet, it is just a firestorm of fury. Yeah. And nobody wants to deal with it. And so just to keep them at bay, they write things like this. And so let me continue on. Let me just finish the article because there's some comments you should, you should finish. Two, two paragraphs. He says, <clears throat> a neighbor who constantly insists that local stand your ground laws make it legal for him to shoot me if I set foot on his property might be correct. And yet I'd still be upset. I'm not scared because I think he's wrong. I'm upset because it sounds like he's planning to shoot me the next time I try and borrow a cup of sugar. Can Sim I break in? Yeah. This is a bad analogy. Because, see, a stand your ground law makes it always legal to shoot, not someone that sets foot on your property. Dude, you don't know much, do you? You can't, a stand your ground law is not neither the moral law of natural law, Catholicism, or the legal law in any stand your ground state says that you can shoot someone that sets foot on your property. It has to be that they are posing an imminent, I mean, it has to be ongoing, threat to self or others. That means they have to have their hand raised like this or they have to be about to raise their hand like that. They might be on your property. They might have broken into your house, guy. And if, they're, if, they, if they put down the knife by the time you load up your rounds and they're walking away or running away, they could still be in your house on your property and it's illegal and immoral to shoot them. Stand your ground laws only mean you could shoot somebody if they are causing an imminent threat to self or others. So your analogies are bad because your reasoning, your understanding of the world is obscured. I'm trying to say this charitably. Oh and then um, the last paragraph is similarly, the marital debt discussion is best left to those um, interested in the fun to consider, but ultimately irrelevant theological questions. Whoa. If we are living our relationships in love, it won't need to be considered. It needs to be considered more than ever. What? Are you... Uh, Watching what's happening to, to marriages across the country, across the world, the sex issue is a huge issue. And I, we know that because of look who's responding to the, these email or yeah. to, to the marital debt. We have people, <clears throat> Catholic women, melting down into hysterics because somebody has the audacity to point to them God's holy word that the marital debt exists. We have a big problem. <laughs> It's the marital debt discussion is best left for those interested in the fun to consider, but ultimately irrelevant theological question. This couldn't be more wrong. I, I'd like to meet this guy. I, 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 he is so, he's like wrong on every possible area. This is not a fun topic. This is a lame topic. O I would say only lame wads whose wives are regularly turning them away have to even invoke it. I agree in that single point. But the problem then is with the wife who's turning you away. The problem's not with you. And it's definitely not an important theological question that doesn't inform real life. It's more like a real life question that barely touches on theology, meaning it's super practical. It's not really very interesting at the theoretical level. It's only interesting at the practical level. It's a purely practical question. You're always bound as a man or a woman, as a married person, to give it up to your spouse when they want it. It's that simple. It's not a woman's issue except by They've made it into a, moral, a woman's issue. That's the problem. Everything's become a woman's issue and then we get the broads out there boo-hooing about just facts. 
in general, so obnoxious. The reason this article touched such a nerve, even though he wasn't he wasn't trying to be mean. No. One, we were Give surprised. us a call, Lucas. Email us, and we'll talk to yeah, you. Yeah, email us, man. We're, we're we're cool, but uh, you got a lot of you got a lot of work to do, my friend. We were surprised to see this uh, quality of article on crisis, which is normally better stuff, and uh, and you know is one of my pub my main publication. Home, I love actually. crisis. Yeah. Love crisis, but the reason it touches a nerve aside from the obvious is because the maybe important theologically but not important practically slur is what was thrown at Steph's book and in a lesser way at my book but more at Steph's book people were all saying okay uh, maybe a wife Steph has to submit to her husband in all things except sin maybe so but, and, and before and we want to interject, no, not maybe so. It says that in 100%. four places in scripture. <laughs> at least seven popes say it. So not maybe so. Definitely so. <laughs> a wife has to submit in all things besides sin to her husband. Which is why tough, smart, independent women pick a good guy. Right. Pick a good guy if you're so smart and tough and independent. But, pick a but good then guy. they'll say the exact same thing he says. Maybe that's true. And they don't, they don't even really mean that. But. There's something disordered with saying the truth, isn't there? Wink, wink. No. Just like this guy said about the marital debt. Is there ever some... It's impossible. It would violate the principle of non-contradiction. It would violate logos for it ever to be disordered to say the truth. They're saying what's really well-ordered, wink, wink, is to say the, to speak falsity, to pretend that a wife is on equal footing of, uh, of uh, dominion with her husband. They're not. They're subject to the, what their husband orders them to do. Same thing. It's never okay for a man or a woman to deny each other sex. It's not okay. And they're doing that, that rights game. Well, maybe you have this right, but aren't you really, aren't you an ogre if you assert the right? No. The right means I have the right. That means you're a good right husband and you're, you're, you're educating your wife on what, something called the marital debt. Bring her to scripture. Bring her to the holy word. Right. Like, like oh, give her the Bible. Be like, start reading. If you're ignorant on this fact, then that's a perfect opportunity to gift your, your bride a Bible right. <laughs> for the next holiday. Right. Like, get, get to reading. I, fundamentally, I think we're just spoiled because our audience, the parish orphans and retrogrades out there, Steph, are faithful they want they don't think you're weird for wanting to do what the natural law and the eternal law command you to do so if with our audience if we're like hey go check these eight places in scripture they're like okay hold on we're, we're noting it out we're, a lot we're of them are like know them by heart like oh yeah we know a lot of them know them. <laughs> but the ones that don't are of goodwill they want to know yeah this guy i keep forgetting his name this guy is uh, Adam Lucas, he is writing for a more unfaithful crowd. And that's why it's surprising to see this at Crisis, because Crisis has a faithful readership. He's writing for an unfaithful crowd, the crowd that would go, well, maybe this is true, but what if we really don't want to follow it? Maybe it's true that I, I collect a mortal sin by denying my wife sex right now, but I'm really, really tired. Maybe... I need to get up at 7.30 for my job, but I'm really tired. It's like you have two problems. One, you should never deny your husband because you're tired. And two, you're working. Right. Which is another thing. They will say, <laughs> well, I'm not sure what the teaching is on that. Well, Book of Sirach makes it clear. A wife brings shame on her husband by supporting him economically. And that, can we just talk about that for just a second, just sidebar? Like that's, another, that's where a lot of the tiredness stuff is coming from is because a lot of these women are working. Like, oh... I'm so tired. I, I have to deny my husband sex tonight. I'm tired because I'm working. It's like, oh, like, like X, X. That is two wrongs right there. It's like, golly. It's, I mean, we're, we're in a bad state of affairs. Since and... I came out with this book, we, we haven't talked about it as much the last few months because Francis has been all over the place, you know, pirouetting all over the <laughs> Catholic Internet. And we've had to cover that. <laughs> Plus, we're just sick of it. But since I came out with this, but really more than this. My book was totally eclipsed by your book in both its pugnaciousness oh, and its ignitability. And it's almost a year now since the first edition of Ask Your Husband came out, Steph. And let me say this. We have, you know, a sizable, we cast a sizable shadow on the Catholic landscape. But I will tell you this much. Um, 
invitations, shout outs, uh, mentions have stopped coming from certain center right corners. Since, not since Catholic Republic came out, not since Rules for Retrogrades, the book came out, not since even Case for Patriarchy came out as much as since Steph's book came out, Ask Your Husband. That, because you are the female Catholic Clarence Thomas, champion of rights for men, <laughs> you're a woman saying women are out of control. Yes. Some of even the center right invitations have been withheld. And they all have this Adam Lucas refrain on their lips. Well, that might be true, but aren't you bad or weird for saying it? And can the I answer say, is like, no. Can I just say like behind the scenes, like a little like peek behind the curtain in the, the trad uh, blogosphere, I guess, if you will. Very interesting. The Iron Curtain of, or the the, the tribes of, of talking head Catholics who align with the Catholic feminists. It's funny, like when one of them would come out and attack my book, it was like all of them. It was like a coordinated a, 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 a attack yep. from, from certain, like I noticed like a lot of the Ignatius people. It was really, it, it was really telling to me like who's in bed with who. Right. And it's icky. Like nobody wants to tick off uh, the the, ca the Catholic listening public with the feminism issue, and when somebody like kind of pokes their head up and says, "I'll I'll take it on a little bit," they're there and they're ready to to shoot you right down. We're not afraid of that. I'm just gonna keep saying what I have to say. Tim yeah. says the same thing. We should just give each other a, a congratulatory. <laughs> Look, I, I got the most beautiful girl out there. I got the the. Uh, best helper out there I it, it, and she's really brave and I had to order last spring was really tough after this book came out Steph doesn't care what people think but it was getting so brutal that uh you know all the stuff that went on behind the scenes when this book came out that she was pregnant with little Penny little Penny Pius who is now nine months old I had to tell her look get off the internet I, I'm worried about you miscarrying because this is so distressing yeah, this is how Catholics treat one another. This is Some how of the Catholics vile treat things that they were saying about for about telling me. the truth about Scripture. Yeah, for telling the truth, just citing those eight places in the Pauline literature that says women can't work, women are, have to submit to their husbands, uh, woman is the glory of man, man is the glory of God. For saying those places, like Solzhenitsyn says, one man can take down an entire empire by telling one truth or one joke based on truth. They know that. So they were coming after Steph Hard, and I'm not talking about they, the James Martins of the world, or Pope Francis. You forgot to say SJ. SJ. It wasn't <laughs> just them. It was the centrists in the Catholic world came after Steph Hard. Now we look back on it and laugh, but a lot of the even center-right invitations have stopped coming. And so be it, man. So I'm be happy it. to be behind the scenes more. I mean, I... Even just recently, I just got rid of my my phone altogether. I think it's just a much happier life for for a woman not to have these things distracting them all the time. So I got rid of that. So it's I'll come on Tim's show from time to time, but I'm happy not to get the the uh, the invites. I guess. <laughs> well, I just mean even stuff yeah. like you know what what happened yeah. to that Frad video. If anybody is out there and knows, I, I did reach out to his people. I have, as far as I know, I haven't heard back. I mean, what happened? That was weird. We're, we're radioactive for saying, look, here's the Catholic teaching on matrimony. We're radioactive that you can't even say, hey, this guy got canceled on Patreon for, an, for a, a video that we all agree with. Well, if you're going to defend somebody too, like if I, like we've been in this position too where we've come up here and we've defended people. I never feel the need to, I'm going to defend this guy, but here's seven disclaimers. If you're in that mode, I just wouldn't do it. No, like, I, I just, if I had to give like 10 disclaimers, like this person's a lunatic or whatever, I just wouldn't do it. I just, I'm either all in or all out. Like, yeah. I'm going to defend somebody. I don't care what people think about them. I'm just up there defending them. It's a net negative if you say, <laughs> hey, man, you know, Tim lost his job. I think he's a maniac, but even maniacs have to eat. You know, just just don't just forego the quote unquote defense. It's more in, more an insult than it is a boon. Uh, even if even if the intent was okay. If you if you're scared 
by what people think, in general, I'm not just talking to other Catholic influencers, but, but Catholics, if you're afraid of what the world thinks and you want to please the world, and you know, you know that Steph and I are right about feminism, but you think it's better to not say the truth, then we ain't for you. You know, like Michael Jordan says in The Last Dance, if you, if you don't like the way I did things, if you don't like the truth telling and you think, hey, the truth should be put on teleological pause for some greater goal, there is no greater goal than the truth, then rules for retrogrades is not your thing. Then ask your husband is not your thing, right? This is, for, this is a book for true Christians. Protestants love this book. Guys like uh, Doug Wilson, who's a Calvinist, and his daughter who wrote a book highly similar to this. That we I actually need to recently. check that out. It's funny because they, they get it, but but it's not for you if you're afraid. There's no fear here. It's just how how I think just our our disposition is, and you know when my book came out and people were like li- feminists were like live tweeting it and articles were coming out and all that stuff. I was just kind of chuckling because those same people had books come out, and I'm just like, good luck. I mean, I don't need to tear you down to bring my product up and. Quite frankly, I literally at mass every Sunday pray for all of my enemies by name. And some of those women <laughs> are, are on that list, but because it's just like they're so ups- they're so Miserable obsessed with what we're doing and how our marriage is and the things that we're saying. And I'm like, listen, this is what we're saying. I'm honest and open about it. You can say and do whatever you want to do on your side. I'm not losing sleep about it. I'm not live tweeting about your your feminist book have your feminist party or whatever enjoy yourself yeah that's that's really steph uh, just a, a lovely lovely <laughs> forgiving sweet person that you know she, you're talking about favale who went on frad what two or th- was it two or three weeks after mm-hmm. she w- did a screed against you and he had her on and uh the most popular comment on pites with aquinas was why don't you have steph on you know this everyone knows what this lady just did to boost up her own garbage book on gender uh, totally, totally irrelevant book. She was trying to boost herself up by trying to take down Steph's book, which was selling off the charts. That's what I said. Was... A lot of really hurtful things, personally hurtful things about <laughs> Steph. She went on Fred. He didn't ask her one one way or the other about it, but you know, he, he he's a friend of ours, and um, so that that was a disappointment. And then what happened last week with him, initially kind of. Kind of stealing himself up and defending us, but then taking the video down after praising me for not taking a video down. Can you imagine? That's, that's, that's really disappointing. That's reminding me to that time. That's what I knew, like like who was kind of in line with who, because she right. came out and then I realized, oh, she has a book coming out. And then I realized, oh, it's on Ignatius Press. And then I put it together. It's like, that's why all these Ignatius Press people have been like, trying to like trash talk me for right. for weeks it started all clicking and i was like uh, okay i have your number and guess what i'm not interested i'm gonna go and bake a bread well, <laughs> listen people we're not just talking about catholicism we're not just talking about feminism when you're a truth teller and this is what i love about my friend quite frankly just a, just a jolly dude good dude uh tough dude or, or Elliot Hulse, or, or anyone. You know, a lot of these are recent reverts to the faith. Maybe, maybe they're still on the, on the way partly. Maybe, maybe they're all the way back. When you're a truth teller, this world comes for you with knives out, with knives drawn, you know, like Brutus and Cassius for Caesar. That's just the way the world works. People are canting sometimes and plotting and scheming, the bad people or the mediocre people, and they come for you with knives drawn. And good people just say, I'm going to be prepared for that next time, but I'm not going to be embittered by the struggle. Um, You know, sometimes you feel like you're dying, like Caesar betrayed by your friend, Brutus, et tu brute. Sometimes you're like, whoa, I expected it from this crazy witch, right? This crazy feminist. Sometimes you're like, oh, et tu whoever, (laughs) brute, frade, whatever. You you, you want to say it. But at two Friday, but you know, that's, that's what it is. We live and breathe. We're all disappointed sometimes. We're all hurt by our friends sometimes. Uh, think of that scene in Braveheart, you know, when, look, William Wallace knows he's going up against, you know, the evil king, but he doesn't think that Robert the Bruce is the figure, you know, the knighted figure in full garb that's working against him. He thinks this is his friend. 
this is not just for Catholics. This is part of the human condition. You're disappointed sometimes. And sometimes you get over it, sometimes you don't. But the point is, we all go through it, right? And I know you guys have been betrayed. I know you guys have felt let down by your friends, parish orphans and retrogrades. It's part of the human condition. You can either become bitter and be angry at these people or understand. I know, man, maybe next time you'll have my back. Uh, I'm not going to forget it, but I do forgive it. It doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't help my total cumulative standing respect for you, but I still love you. Carry on. Maybe next time you'll do the noble thing. Maybe next time you'll learn bravery. You know, fortitude comes easier to some people than others. And, you know, for, forgiven. Maybe not forgotten, but forgiven. This is a very human thing. So it's been, it's been a year like that for us. <laughs> Let me say that much. It's been a year like that for us. Lots of those Lots Etu of Brute moments. Up. Lots of prayers up. Just just keep us in your prayers, parish orphans and retrogrades. We'll keep you in ours. Never grow bitter. Always in the fight. Always stay strong to the uh, extent you can. We're just, you know, we're trying to be comical with this guy. I was a little surprised to see this on Crisis. But, but God bless this guy, Adam Lucas. God bless, you know, everybody out there who's just trying to do their best. But um, the truth God matters. God yeah. help us all. <laughs> Love you guys. Dazvolt. Yeah.